Well, good morning, everybody. If I haven't met you before, my name is Grant. Welcome to the sleep-in service. We're glad that you're here, whether you're online or here in the room. We're just really, really grateful to be able to share some of this time together. Before we begin today, I'd like to take just a small moment and have a bit of a family conversation with the church family here at CTK. Every four years, my pastoral world goes a little bit crazy. On top of the normal chaos of life, which I must say we have had a significant amount of chaos in the year 2020, uh, we stir in this thing called a general election. And inevitably, people start pressuring from both sides and voicing their opinions. And here's the interesting thing. Everybody seems to think their opinion is God's opinion. Do you know what I'm talking about, right? And then it happens. Inevitably, someone sends me an email or a phone message and asks this question. Grant, when are you going to tell us who to vote for? (laughs) As I've said every four years for the past almost 20 years, I will never, ever, ever tell you who to vote for. But I will tell you this, registering to vote and actually voting is both a right and a responsibility. And I hope and pray as a family of faith here at Christ the King that we would take that right and responsibility seriously. I want to encourage you, not only as a follower of Jesus, but as a fellow citizen to be involved in the process. Now I know, because I have talked with many of you, that you are highly frustrated with both the people and the process But I want to remind you of this as well. I've traveled in parts of the world where people dream of being able to do what we take for granted. So here's my encouragement to you as your pastor, your friend, and your brother. Be humble before God. Pray and ask God for wisdom. Read the scripture as your source of truth. And seek God as you do your best to make godly decisions. Don't depend on your past affiliations or the news media to tell you what to do. Instead, seek to make decisions that align with God's heart. I think what the world needs now, right now, is people who will discern God's heart on the issues, use our voice. And I also want to remind you of something else, that no matter who wins on November the 3rd, Jesus will still be ruling and reigning in heaven, which means our future is in good hands. And I would invite everybody to say amen to something like that. So this past week, an article caught my eye. You can check it out on Google or whatever search engine you use. Zookeepers at the London Zoo had to isolate several parrots. And I said parrots, not parents. Apparently somebody thought I said parents last night and the story went all wrong. But zookeepers at the London Zoo had to isolate several parrots because of their proclivity to profanity. Apparently someone donated a group of African gray parrots that had been listening in on the small talk inside of their owner's homes and they learned to cuss a lot. So they came to the zoo with this profanity-laced vocabulary and ended up offending people who were paying really good money to come and see these particular birds because when they arrived at the cage, the birds would cuss them out. Those birds are currently being quarantined. I just find the irony in that so beautiful. They've been quarantined in order to learn better words because their vocabulary began with one small word and apparently it was a very, very, very bad word. We've been doing a series called Start Small where we're working not on the negative side of starting small but on the positive side of starting small and we've used this statement to kind of guide us through it. Small things done over a long period of time have the greatest impact. And we added this phrase to it. When we start small, the world, our world actually changes. So this week we're going to watch Jesus go small one more time. And yet we're also going to see him have the biggest impact on a human being that any human can ever experience. The Bible says this in Luke chapter 19. And I know many of you have been around church for a really, really, really long time. And as soon as I begin to read one of these old classic Bible stories, you're going to go, I already got it have figured this all out, Grant, we're good. What if we approach scripture again like we were hearing it for the very, very first time? I believe God has something very specific for all of us today. The Bible says Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was because he was short. He couldn't see over the crowd. It's not politically correct, but it is Bible. Okay, stick with me. Verse number four, so we ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. 
This story starts with a series of small decisions. Jesus makes a decision to go through Jericho. Could have gone anywhere that he wanted to. I mean, he has an opportunity in this moment. He could go to Jerusalem. He could go back to Galilee. He could go anywhere he wants to. But Jesus decides to go through Jericho. And it seems like this small, meaningless, insignificant decision. But we know something. God's timing and God's geography is always perfect. Because Jesus knows something. There is a vertically challenged individual with a very broken past waiting for him there in a tree of all things. The Bible says that Zacchaeus was actually stirred. Something drew Jesus towards Jericho. We would call it his omniscience. But the Bible says something stirred inside of Zacchaeus as well. Something drew him to Jesus. Now, we all know it was the Holy Spirit drawing him into an encounter with God. But I don't think we can overlook the significance of that small decision. Zacchaeus decides to go and see Jesus. He's prompted by God. I want to see Jesus. That's actually a really big deal if you know something about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector and he was hated by his community. He was a Jewish man who was working for the Roman Empire. He was taxing people and then taxing them again and then taxing them on their taxes and then taxing them on their taxes, on their taxes, on their taxes. He was corrupt and hated And here's another thing about this guy you need to know. He actually thought his decision to go to Jericho and see Jesus that day was his idea. And before you judge him, we all do that. We all did. You all, most of us. You thought you decided to come to church today or you decided to turn on the live stream. You decided, make no mistake, the reason we're doing this is because God wanted us to do it. Okay, God is running this show. God is running your show. God is in charge of everything. And he was in charge of Zacchaeus being there that morning and climbing up that tree that particular day. I mean, God was in charge of absolutely everything. And I don't know about you, but the fact that God is in charge of everything right now, that is a great comfort to me as a person. Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus, but there's a small tension. I think we all have to consider this. I want to see Jesus, but would Jesus want to see me? And this man's a broken man. His story is a mess. And I think all of us can relate to that at some level. He wants to see Jesus, but there's this, this hesitation in his heart. Is Jesus going to want to see me? Well, the Bible tells us what happens in verse number five. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, isn't it interesting? He calls him by name. Zacchaeus. Come down immediately. You may want to circle those words, come down. We'll come back to them in a bit. Come down immediately. I must stay. You may want to circle those words words as well. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Some of your translations say this. When Jesus reached the spot, he stopped. It's just a small, little, tiny detail in the story, so easily overlooked, but don't miss it. God chose that spot. God stopped at that spot. God paused in that moment because he knew there was a God-ordained connection that was about to happen with a very, very, very broken man. God stopped, and so should we. I don't know about you, but, but I'm an expert at blowing through moments and completely missing the point on a regular, regular basis. I think we're all experts at just blowing through a moment. Why? Because we're all caught up in this go big or go home kind of mentality. I mean, we move at a velocity that most people cannot keep up with. We are moving from point A to point B so quickly. And we miss all of these beautiful little interruptions that God's laid out for us. So we just blow through it and we blow it. All God's asking us to do, just stop. Just pause for a second. We all know we should stop before we hit send, but we blow through it and then we blow it. We know we should stop before we react because here comes that anger again and we blow through it and we blow it. We know we should stop and just listen for that still small voice to tell us exactly what to do, but our velocity just doesn't allow us to do it and we end up missing the person and the need and the cry for help and the opportunity to engage with Jesus because what Jesus wants is not for us to blow through it and blow it. He wants us to connect in his mission. Jesus just stops at a designated spot for a divine interruption and he connects with Zacchaeus in a profound way. I put it in your outline this way. It's a small moment on a small spot that welcomes a deep connection. So let's talk about this connection thing for just a second. 
The reality is God has called all of us into a huge mission. I mean, it's really big, right? When you think our goal is to have every human being on the planet have a face-to-face encounter with Jesus, that is a huge intimidating mission. Reaching them, that's intimidating. But instead of crafting a big plan and renting a big place and doing something huge, what if today we just focused on the single small spot where God placed us? Some of you have heard me say this so many times. You're already rolling your eyes, but stick with me for just a second. God put you in a very specific geographic location for a reason. It's to affect the people that live around you. Here's my challenge. What if this week, inspired by Jesus, who reached out to this guy named Zacchaeus, what if we made a small decision to bless the people that God has sovereignly placed around us? Think about it this way. I put it in your outline as an an acrostic that spells the word bless. The B. What What if we just began in prayer? What if we started being disciplined enough to strategically pray for the people that God has placed around us? What if we prayed every day for them by name and asked God for an opportunity to be able to share our God story with them at some point? What if we just prayed for the people that lived in the closest proximity to us? What if we began in prayer? Secondly, what if we learned their names? I mean, isn't it amazing in the small little detail that God who knows everything actually knew Zacchaeus's name? Now, we're not all omniscient. We don't know everything. And so we're actually gonna have to ask. And I'm not encouraging you to rifle through your neighbor's mail in order to figure out what their names are. I'm just asking you to pay attention to the people around you, right? I'll tell you what, after you've been in a neighborhood for 10 years, hey, bro, hi, buddy, hey, lady, that's not helpful whatsoever, all right? Actually learning their names. Why? Because if they matter to God, they should matter to you. That's why I love being able to talk to Mary and Levi and Megan and Nick and Nicole and Jess and Emily, because if they matter to God, they should matter to me. Here's the E in bless. It's to engage in conversations. And if you're engaged in conversation, can I make a plea to you? Be normal. Like, just be normal. Ask normal questions. How's it going for you? How are you doing having your kids at home all the time? How are your internet connections going these days? This is a difficult season for everybody. Ask them. Be be godly curious about what it is that's going on in their lives. Here's what we don't want you to do. We don't want you to do this Christian garbage that we learn from people that go something like this. Hey, neighbor, it's really good to see you. I see you have a car. Your car has four tires. Do you know there's also four spiritual laws? And the first one is that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And your neighbor's like, what just happened to me? And then you wonder why they're hiding in their backyard. Just a normal conversation. Here's the S, seek to be intentional. Connecting with people around you requires decisions, small decisions. So what if you made a decision, instead of just walking around your neighborhood, to prayer walk your neighborhood? What if you created enough margin in your life that when you ran into your neighbor at the mailbox, you could actually stop for three minutes and just ask them a simple question. How are you really doing What if you stopped hiding in your backyard and moved out to your front yard for a little bit just so you could actually make face-to-face contact with people? What if you learned to walk across the lawn or walk across the driveway on purpose and you purposefully went not to just talk, but you purposefully went to listen? Listening for clues when your neighbors say things like, I need, I wonder, hey, I was thinking. God is calling all of us to find their sycamore tree because with that tree comes an opportunity. And here's the final S, is to share your God story. I'll tell you what, this is so important because you have to do this in order. You learn their story first and then you share yours. I get asked this question fairly frequently. How did a kid from Manitoba end up preaching in Bellingham, Washington? I'm just like, blame it on God because he's the one who called us here. But in that moment, I have an opportunity to share how God did an incredible thing in my life and in Laurel's life and how he drew us to a place where we have been so privileged to do ministry. I mean, I promise you this week, if you will bless your neighbor, God will use that small little decision and he may not just change their life, he will change yours. 
Jesus reached out to Zacchaeus. If you read the gospels, Jesus had prayed about his mission. Jesus knew his name. He engaged him in conversation. He was intentional about that spot. He shared his story because it's all summed up in these words. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus is saying, I've come to help you out of your broken story into this beautiful place of grace and mercy. And here's what's amazing about Zacchaeus. I'm going to remind you again. He's a slimy little crook and I'm not overstating it. He collected extra taxes from people. He exploited a system for his own gain. He's a hurting guy who was hurting people. And let's just stop and pause here for just a moment and learn a little bit of wisdom. I don't like this statement, but it's true. Hurt people hurt people. Angry people lash out. Frustrated people frustrate others. Whatever has hurt or wounded you eventually will work itself out and you will wound and hurt somebody else unless you actually bring that to the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you to heal this. I'm seeing hurt people hurt people right now, arguing about stuff, like whether I have to wear this thing on my face or not. Nobody likes it. We can all agree on that. The question is this, how many people are you hurting because you're holding on to your way? Hurt people hurt people. Here's another one. Lost people lose people. When I was lost in my own sin, I lost friends. I lost connection with people that I loved. I lost myself because I was so lost in my own brokenness I didn't have the capacity to care for anyone else but me. Every single one of us today is called into that moment. We've got to do a gut check if I'm hurt, am I hurting somebody else? If I'm lost, am I losing people? If you're losing relationships out of the apple cart of your life right now, you may want to do a gut check. And this is where it gets really hopeful. Found people find people. I mean, I love that. People who've tasted the amazing grace of Jesus, they want other people to experience it. New followers of Jesus, I don't know if you've noticed this or not. If you want to meet an infectious person, someone who's full of joy and can't wait to talk about it, meet a new believer in Jesus. It's an amazing thing to experience because once you've been found by God, you want other people to be found and it just grows from there. As God puts these broken pieces of your life back together again, you discover this amazing truth. Not only do found people find people, but healthy people help people. Followers of Jesus who are spiritually healthy, they realize something. This is not about, my life is not about what I like or I don't like or how right I think to be and how you need to get with my program. That is not what our life is about. Our life is about being on mission with Jesus so we can be in the right spot at the right time so a guy like Zacchaeus can experience the same grace that we've experienced. Now look at what comes next. It's so predictable. It happens in scripture over and over and over again. This beautiful moment happens. This crook becomes a Jesus follower and then a group of church people show up and all the joy and all of the celebration just gets sucked right out of the middle of the story. Verse number seven, all the people saw this and began to mutter. Isn't that a great way to celebrate someone coming to Christ? They begin to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner, the nerve. A savior wants to connect with the sinner. What is Jesus thinking, right? And they stand on the outside and they start to think to themselves. And I tell you what, it's so easy to judge them, but I want to caution you. If you judge them, you're guilty of the very thing that we're talking about right here. Because there's something inside of all of us. It's just like, why is Jesus hanging out with that person? That person doesn't deserve the same kind of grace and mercy that I got because after all, I'm the good person. I've been following Jesus along here like a really good little boy for a really long time. I've been going to church. I checked the right boxes. I am very religious. I am obviously, like when it comes to the lunch line, I am obviously a better choice for Jesus to come and hang out with because my house is nicer, my house is cleaner, and I have Christian magazines on my coffee table. I mean, and on top of everything else, I'm taller than he is. Religious judgment 
just crushes a human heart. And that's what it is. It's a small judgment. But I think it's one we all get stuck in. Why is Jesus hanging with that person? I've got a better question. Why not them? Don't they matter? Are they messy? (laughs) Yes. Have you forgotten how messy you were when you came to Christ? Didn't God save you? Shouldn't you be so excited that God is actually pouring his attention on somebody else who knows that? I mean, didn't, have you forgotten how messy you were in the spot when Jesus came and called you by name? I mean, why would I want to withhold the grace that I experienced from anyone else being able to experience the same thing? These are tough questions. And they're tough questions because they expose a small little thing like religious judgment that I promise you will crush your heart and wreck every relationship that you have. Hey, for the record, Christ the King Church is full of Zacchaeus kind of people. And we're good with that around here. In fact, I'll tell you on the front end, if you're uncomfortable with the mess of humanity, this may not be the best place for you because we run towards the messes around here. And if you think you're too messy for God, I wanna just encourage you with something. The God that we serve at Christ the King is the kind of God who gets his hands dirty in the mess of broken people because he's in the job. This is what he loves to do. He likes to put broken people back together and turn them into beautiful people. Here's how the Bible continues. Verse number eight. Let me give you some context. So apparently the dinner party kicks in. And Zacchaeus is there with Jesus and some of the disciples are there and they're sharing a meal and the religious people have kind of created a ring around this entire thing and then Zacchaeus stands up and makes an announcement. Verse number eight, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. This is the encouraging thing for me. When you have an encounter with the real God of the Bible, everything changes. Absolutely everything changes. This guy goes from being a crook to a philanthropist in a matter of seconds, which means that there are people in this room right now who are addicts and you're about to be transformed into an apostle. Some of you are going to exchange porn for prophecy. Some people are going to be transformed from a liar to a leader, a mistake to a miracle, from broken to beautiful, because that's what God does. 1115, if somebody doesn't say amen in this room right now, there we go, all right? That big change starts with a single small decision to encounter Jesus. I love how something small can have the biggest eternal change. Think about that for just a second. That small little decision changes everything. Some of you still aren't convinced. So let me put it to you this way. Let's make this uh, in a language we can all understand. Let's talk in the context of food, okay? Let's say I showed up at your house and say, look, here's the deal. 10,000 of my closest friends are gonna be at your house in a while. And I want you to barbecue for every single one of them. You're gonna need meat. We're either going to serve elephant or rabbits. (laughs) I know some of you are freaked out. Stick with me. So which one do you want to raise if you're going to feed 10,000 of my closest friends? Rabbits or elephants? This comes from my friend Dave Browning's book, Deliberate Simplicity. He wrote it this way. If you want 1,000 pounds of meat, raise elephants. If you want 1,000 tons of meat, raise rabbits because if you put two elephants in a room and two rabbits in a room in three years you will have three elephants or you will have 476 million (laughs) rabbits but the choice is yours just a small decision I'm not advocating eating elephants or rabbits, just so we're clear, okay? Zacchaeus makes a small decision. I'm going to right a wrong and pay restitution. I'm going to pay it back. Here's a novel thought. Zacchaeus thinks, I'm going to make a decision to do the right thing. I've been ripping people off and now I'm going to make it right and I'm going to pay restitution. I'm going to return what I stole. Some of us need to do that. We so want God to bless us then let's make the blessed decision 
to make some of our wrongs right. For some of us, we've got to make a decision. I'm going to pay back that delinquent loan. I'm going to go back and ask forgiveness for what I did, and then I'm actually going to, to make it tangible by paying restitution. I'm going to return that little thing that I stole 20 plus years ago because it just needs to be done. I want you to, to make sure you don't overlook this. Zacchaeus is making a small but profound decision, but don't lose this fact. The very way that he's going to have to pay back all of these debts is no longer available to him anymore because as a follower of Jesus, he can't rip people off anymore. He's going to have to get a whole new career to go along with his new calling. This little tax man is going to need a new line of work to go with his new heart. This is no small thing because he's going to have to trust God to honor his decision to do it right. I just want every one of us to know this. Sometimes doing the right thing will cost you, but God will honor you every single time. Jesus transforms his whole heart and he goes from being a tax crook to an adopted child of the most high God. And the story wraps up with these words. Verse number nine, Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house. Because this man too is the son of Abraham. I love this last verse. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. That is a small statement that encompasses the big plan of God for all of humanity. It's a big proclamation. Jesus saves a small man with big, big, big salvation. So let's make this really, really personal and bring the application in as best we can. Earlier in the message, I asked you to underline a couple of words. I asked you to underline, come down, I must stay. And now I'm going to ask you if you've got your Bible with you or if you've got your notes with you to underline that last little phrase, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost Let's be very transparent. I love that Jesus says these words to Zacchaeus, come down. I wonder how many of us need to be obedient to that statement today too. Hey, just come down here. Come down from your lofty place and have a face-to-face -face conversation with Jesus. You know, let's be, let's be honest. Curiosity is what drove Zacchaeus up the tree There's a lot of things that can drive us up the tree of elitism. So what do you need to come down from? Do you need to come down from this position where you believe you are right and the rest of humanity is wrong and if they would just get with your program, everything would be fine? Do you need to come down from this position of having to be right all of the time to the point where you're not listening to anyone except to yourself? Do you need to come down from that place that looks down on the rest of the people in the world and this judgment just automatically creeps into your heart? It's like, how could they be so deceived if they would only listen to me? And could it be that that judgment is so seated in your heart that the one thing you're actually doing right now is refusing to love your enemy? If you need a really good message about loving your enemy, you may want, may want to go back a week and listen to Pastor Brian Barron's from last weekend because Jesus called us all, all out on the carpet about what happens when we refuse to love that person. What do you need to come down from? Not just for the sake of coming down, but so that you could actually have a face-to-face, heart-to-heart conversation and connection with the God of the universe, Jesus Christ. I'll be honest, transparent moment. I have been so disillusioned this past week. Just over the last like 48 to 72 hours, I'm on a lot of pastor feeds on social media and and my heart has just been so disillusioned and crushed because I have watched pastors, my peers, the clergy, men and women of the cloth, whatever you want to call, I've watched them on social media argue about whether or not they should pray for the president 
because he's been diagnosed with COVID-19. And just so we're clear, they weren't arguing about whether or not they were going to pray for him publicly. They were arguing about whether or not they were going to bother praying for him privately. What are we doing? Where have we gotten so lost? You know what I love about being a Jesus follower? It means I put Jesus in front of everything. And I want to remind you that Jesus has us covered no matter where we find ourselves on a political spectrum. This is what Jesus said. Pray for your leaders. Pray for the sick. Even if you find yourself on the diametrically opposed opposite end of the political spectrum, he's even got you there because he said pray for your enemy. When politics start determining whether or not we're going to pray for a sick person or not, God have mercy on us. God forgive us for that lofty arrogance that says, I'm going to call my own shots. Thank you very much. Come down. Have a conversation. I'm challenging all of us to do this, including me. Come on down. Let's talk with Jesus about this. Secondly, I love these words. He says, I must stay. I'm amazed at how many believers I feel like. And granted, it just feels like, like the whole world's going to hell. <laughs> I actually read my Bible, and my Bible says God is sovereign and in control. So let's not ever forget that God said that he was with us. In fact, here's his response to you. If you're feeling alone, isolated, and scared right now, the God of the universe is standing in the spot right in front of your heart saying, I must stay. I must stay. If you're in a living room right now, the God of the universe is with you. If you're in a coffee shop right now, right beside you, wrapped all around you, is the holy trinity of God. You are not alone. And that should bring such extraordinary comfort to all of us right now. And here's the last line. It's tied to, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. But the words are so specific, it's beautiful. Salvation has come to this house. Last night we were in a prayer time and Randy Borland, one of our staff people, he prayed this. And I thought it was so unbelievably beautiful. I had to share it with you. When Jesus said salvation has come to this house, he was not talking about a thing. He was talking about a person. Jesus brought his salvation with him into the home of this person who needed him. If you're in a home right now, salvation's right there. If you're in this room right now, salvation is right here in front of us. And God can do for you what he did for Zacchaeus. You know, I love this beautiful truth. Sinners need saviors. And isn't it amazing that we have a savior who would come to the base of a tree and talk to an ostracized man and say, hey, why don't you come down? We're about to have a dinner party that's gonna last for the rest of eternity. I don't care about your reputation. I don't care about your past. I don't care about all the things you've got wrong. Zacchaeus, let's talk. Well, I think we need some time and space today to talk to God. So uh, we're going to take a few moments today. I think we can spare nine minutes because it's only 12.06, which means I got nine minutes left on the clock. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back and join me right now. And here's what we're going to do. We've been doing this all weekend long and I have seen God show up because God's people made a decision to just stop on a spot and look to Jesus. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to prompt you to pray. Nobody can make you do anything. I'm going to prompt you to pray by sharing just a little bit about my own journey from this past week. And then we're going to give you some space to talk to Jesus. And the band's going to play just a little bit during that time. And then they're going to sing a few lines of a song over us. 
And then I'm going to prompt you to pray again, and then you're going to have an opportunity, some space to be able to do that. And then they're going to sing some more lyrics to a song over top of us, and we're going to receive it as a blessing. And we're going to all take an opportunity today. I don't think it's, I don't think it's very beneficial when you just parrot what I pray, because we heard what happens with parrots at the beginning of the message, right? Right? I think it's better if, if you just have your own conversation with God. So if you're at home right now, I want to encourage you to change your posture. You might need to to get rid of some distractions. You might need to turn off your phone. Don't turn off your TV or your computer. Okay, just stick with me. And if you're here in the room, I'm going to invite you to change your posture and and put aside the distractions as well. So if you're here in the room with me, would you stand right now? And and we're going to take some time to pray. Pray. And I want to remind you, the same Jesus who showed up at the bottom of the tree with Zacchaeus, he is standing directly in front of you right now. Don't miss him. He's right there in front of you. So this past week, I found myself praying these words out loud. Oh, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I trust you. I love you, but I'm struggling to figure all this out. So even though my eyes are drawn in so many different directions, Jesus, I choose to look to you. I'm going to turn my eyes to Jesus. So I want to encourage you right now to take a moment to say from the depth of your heart whatever you need to say to reestablish your trust in God. Maybe you just need to say, Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I look to you. Jesus, I see you. So whatever you need to say to him right now, I'd like to invite you to bow your head in prayer and to just say it from the depth of your soul to him. Share it with him. We'll give you a moment to just do that right now. turn our eyes towards Jesus this morning when we see him fear just seems to disappear the truth is none of us wants to be wrapped in fear today and I love that Jesus has an answer his perfect love casts out all fear but I know each one of us if we were honest we're carrying with us specific fears God, I'm afraid our nation's gonna get ripped right down the middle. God, I'm afraid that our family's divided over all of this stuff. God, I'm afraid that I'm more, I'm more concerned with being right than being righteous. So today I wanna encourage you to take a moment and to say it from the depth of your heart, God, these are all the things that are scaring me right now. Here's the good news. Jesus can take it and nothing you say is going to surprise him. So take a moment right now and just tell God, God, this is what I'm afraid of in my life right now. Let's pray. Let's take that to God right now.
Last line said he knows just what to do. Can I tell you what Jesus wants you to do right now? It's to be obedient to this verse. Jesus said, cast all of your anxiety on me because I care for you. All of your anxiety towards him. God superintended the scripture writer to take that verse and embody it for all of us, which means this. Right now, you have an opportunity to hand all of your anxiety, your worry, your cares, and your fears, and not just lay them out on the table, but gather them all up and actually give them into the hands of a God who can care for you. I want to remind you again, he can take it. And I know this whole series is about starting small. So I want to encourage you right now. What if you just took one care, one worry, one part of your life that's putting your stomach in knots? What if right now you took it and you gave it to Jesus? And you laid it down at the foot of the cross and you said, God, you said, cast all of your anxiety. Okay, here's one piece. What if you started small, knowing that God can care for you in that moment? give you an opportunity to take a moment and do exactly that, to hand over just one anxiety, one care right now into the good, beautiful, and competent care of your Savior. Let's pray. tell you the fear that I had to lay down last night and this morning my fear is that the enemy is going to win and he's going to rip God's family right down the center over things that are not worth dividing over wrapped up in that fear is the fact that I have pastor friends that are quitting right and left They're just not doing this anymore people walking away saying I just don't understand and caught up in our rightness. I have had to lay that fear down over and over again because I love the bride of Christ. I love this church. I love this community and I know God said uh, his desire for us was to be unified perfectly in art. You know how that happens? Jesus. (laughs) It happens with Jesus and only Jesus. So today I'm going to ask you to make a declaration. What if we started today, we started small with just our stammering lips and a little bit of music? What if we said, Jesus, in the midst of all of this, we've laid our fear down. We did what you told us to do. You said, cast all of our anxiety on you because you care for us. What What if we said, Jesus, we choose to praise you in the midst of all of this. We praise you as our rock and our deliverer, our fortress and our covering. What if we said, we praise you as the one who can exchange perfect love for this crazy fear that we're wrapped inside of us. What if we were able to say today, I don't care what's happening in the world around me hallelujah our God reigns 
He reigns now. He will reign in the future. We have nothing to fear. It's all about His strength and His majesty and His power and His holiness. I mean, what if we could seriously scream from the rooftops, everybody else, we know you're afraid, but the people of God are not afraid because we have a King and He loves you and He'll stand at the bottom of the tree and call you by name out of your mess into His glorious presence. Church, if we can't sing hallelujah, our God reigns. What in the world can we share with a community that's lost and broken right now? Hallelujah, our God reigns. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Let's worship and sing it together. into that moment. If you need prayer for anything at all, go to prayer.ctk.church. We have a whole team of people and they will bless you and cover you. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. Thanks again for watching. We're so glad that you joined us today. Once again, we hope you'll get involved in biblical face-to-face -face community wherever you happen to be today. If you'd like more information about Christ the King Community Church, if you'd like to give online, or if you'd like to submit a prayer request, or even get connected in a small group, you can find out more about us at ctk.church.